Well, good morning, church family. We greet you this Lord's Day. Trust that you're doing well, that you're healthy, and your family, all your needs are met. We gathered here to worship the Lord this, this Sunday morning, and we trust that you're doing the same, that you're gathering with your family. If you aren't already, we're looking forward to opening God's Word and worshiping Him uh, as a church family uh, together this morning. Let me just make a couple of announcements, and then we'll get into our song service. Um, as of now, and obviously this could change if new information does come out, but as of now, this will be our final uh, online uh, service. As you know, uh, this coming Wednesday night on May the 6th, we do plan to uh, meet in person, and so we look forward to seeing all that are able to come. Now, I don't want that to, I want you to feel pressured or, or obligated to be here. If you feel uh, any sense of, uh, un, un, if you're uncomfortable in any way about coming and still gathering in light of the COVID-19 circumstances, then feel free to stay home. Uh, certainly, we, we don't blame you there, but we do want to open the church back up. Uh, many of you are ready. I've been ready. And, and uh, so we look forward to worshiping this Wednesday night, May the 6th. Uh, next Sunday, uh, a week from today, on uh, I believe that will be the 10th, May the 10th, we will uh, gather together on Sunday as well. Now, obviously, things won't be back to normal like what we're used to. Uh, we will have two services, but you'll only be attending one. Uh, in, in response to our governor's recommendations of keeping our uh, keeping our, our total amount of people at 25% of our capacity, and uh, just just you know continuing to try to limit the spread of, of germs, we're we're going to have two services. The first one at 9 a.m. and that is for everyone uh, age 65 and older. And uh, we'll, we'll keep that service right at about an hour long, like normal. We'll dismiss at 10, and then at 11 a.m. we'll have our second service, and that's for uh, those uh, below the age of 65. And so keep these things in mind. Help us when you get here to uh, take some Germex and, and just practice good, uh, good health habits there. Uh, we do look forward to seeing each of you once again. We've missed it, all of you. I appreciate your cooperativeness, how you... Uh, been and how our church has been during this time. Our, our views have just really blown my mind on how many views we've got on these online services. It's really been a blessing to, to sit there and watch that. And, and, uh, and so I hope you've enjoyed them. But once again, we are looking forward to seeing all of you. We miss you uh, greatly and we've been praying for you and we'll continue to do so. All right, I don't know of any other announcements right now. So uh, Mark Smith has been a blessing singing to us each, each week during these online services. And He'll be singing once again this morning. So, Brother Mark, you come on at this time.
thank you, Brother Mark. Once again, hasn't he been a blessing past month, month and a half that we've had these services? I appreciate very much him singing and uh, Brother Ken singing on Easter Sunday. And then we've had a few that have come each service to uh, run the camera and uh, just be some moral support so I'm not preaching to a completely empty auditorium. So that's all been a blessing. I'm grateful for that. Uh, John chapter 15 this morning, John chapter 15, and we will finish this series that we started on the uh, I am statements that Christ made concerning himself. John chapter number 15. Have you ever heard someone say that the reason they don't attend church is because of all the hypocrites that are there? I'm sure you've heard that. I've heard that excuse. If you haven't heard it from someone, you know of someone who has heard that excuse. And, and, and really, uh, that excuse w almost would make me angry if it wasn't true. But it is true, isn't it? Uh, no one is perfect, and we all play the hypocrite uh, at times. Uh, but there's no doubt, no doubt that spiritual hypocrisy uh, runs rampant, certainly, in the church. There are loads of people who pretend to be uh, fervent Christ followers on Sunday, on the Lord's Day, but the remainder of the week they live anything but a God-honoring life. And we get that and we realize that, we know that. And, and, uh, and so the world and the church is full of hypocrisy. Many of you know that the word hypocrite actually means uh, to put on a mask, to, to put on a front. It's play acting, it's intentionally acting. Uh, like you're something or someone outwardly, but inwardly you know that you're completely different. It's kind of like the story I heard, maybe I've told this before, but I heard a story about a zoo that was going through some financially difficult and desperate times, and, and so they advertised in the local paper that they needed some help, and a, a very well-built, muscular man, much like myself, decided uh, he would apply for a job. And uh, so he came in to apply for the job, and he was very disappointed to find out that the only job they had available was impersonating a gorilla. You see, the, the zoo was uh, struggling financially, and their gorilla had, had died. They had a large group coming in uh, one, the, the, the following weekend, and this group was going to bring in uh, much-needed money, and so they didn't want them to be disappointed with no gorilla. Uh, in its habitat, and so they decided, decided that they needed to hire someone to wear a gorilla suit and, and uh, pose as the gorilla. Well, money was tight for the well-built muscular man, and so he took the job, and everything was going real well for the first few hours, but after a while, man, just the heat of wearing that suit and the bananas finally got to him, and, and uh, the, the, the owner of the zoo came to him, he had an earpiece in, and buzzed him and said, hey, uh, these people want to see the gorilla swing from a tree, and so when you get a chance, swing on the tree from limb to limb. And so he did. He tried, but like I said, he was very weak from the heat, and uh, <clears throat> as he was swinging from one tree limb to another, he lost his grip and ended up going flying into the lion's den next to him. Well, he immediately started shouting, help, help, this lion's going to eat me, and as soon as he did, the lions opened up his mouth and said, Fella, if you don't stop screaming, we're both going to lose our jobs. <laughs> and, uh, and so the hypocrite, playing the hypocrite. Well, when it comes to the New Testament, who is the supreme example of the ultimate hypocrite? No doubt it would be Judas, wouldn't it? Judas. Judas was in the inner circle with Jesus. Judas went on the mission trips. Judas heard all the sermons. Judas... Uh, hung out. He was a part of the greatest Sunday school small group, if you will, that there ever was. He was sent out to preach and, and perform miracles with the other 11 disciples. And, and so for all purposes and all intents, uh, Judas looked like, he sounded like, he acted like he was one of the guys. But it was a front. It was a front. It was a fake. He was a counterfeit. He looked like the real deal, but he wasn't. He did all of the God things on the outside, but he had never been transformed and never been changed on the inside. That brings us to our text in John chapter number 15. You see, when you get to John chapter 15, Judas has just taken off to, to betray Jesus, Jesus to the Pharisees, and the rest of the disciples are really stressing out and freaking out about it. They can't believe it. They're thinking, what in the world is going on? 
I wonder, could this happen to me? Maybe I'm a fraud. Maybe I'm a fake like him. Maybe I'm in trouble. You see, they never, they never dreamed that Judas wasn't one of them. But not only were they confused and upset about Judas, I think there's some confusion and maybe even a little bit upset about Jesus. You see, they had in their mind that Jesus was to set up this physical kingdom and bring Israel out of bondage from the Romans. They saw themselves as being the ones to reign with him in this kingdom on earth. You remember they even thought about who's, who's going to sit on the right and on the left-hand side of Jesus and who would be the most powerful. And you remember from last Sunday that Jesus has just told them that he's going to the cross to die, that he's going to a place that they can't even go with him, and that rocked their world. And so these disciples' heads are spinning. Their, their hearts are, are breaking, and, and uh, they, they want to know exactly who Jesus is and really who Judas is. And so they're, they're complex at this time. Who's real? Who's not? What's real? What's not? So Jesus brings his disciples from the upper room where they are, where they just had the Last Supper, and he starts walking towards the Garden of Gethsemane. And no doubt Jesus knows how his disciples are feeling. And he looks around as he heads to the Garden of Gethsemane and he leaves the city. He looks around at the Kidron Valley and it's full of vineyards. I've seen it. I've walked it in person. And he says something to try to help him understand exactly what is going on. This is the final of the I am statements. We've seen him make statements like, I am the bread. I am the life. We are the light. We've seen him say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, and what he's saying is if you can understand how these statements affect you physically, then you'll better understand how I affect you spiritually. Here's the final one. Notice our text in John chapter 15, and we'll read the first eight verses. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. A man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. And so this final I am statement, Jesus says, I am the true vine. Now, some people mistakenly think that the vine is that long trailing limbs that sprawls along the fence. In reality, that's, that's the branches. The vine is the trunk of the plant, that which is closest to the ground. The vine is where all the nutrients, all the, all the strength, all the vitality, all the life comes and makes its way to the branches. In other words, if the branches aren't connected to the vine, then there's no way that they're going to receive what they need to receive to be able to produce the fruit that they need to produce. And so Jesus is obviously saying here, if you can understand this vine and how it's the source of life for the branch, then you understand that I am the only source of life for everyone who believes. For in all life, all energy, all vitality is going to flow through Christ and into everyone who is connected to him as the true vine. In other words, Jesus is saying in a nutshell, apart from me, you won't have spiritual life. You won't have spiritual life. And so in these few words, he not only helps and aids these disciples to really better understand who he is, but really he helps them understand exactly who Judas is, doesn't he? Judas, uh, Jesus here describes two branches. Number one, fruitful ones, and number two, fruitless ones. He describes those who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and he describes those who really possess Jesus Christ. The Judas branch, that's the branch that doesn't produce fruit, and the Jesus branch, those, uh, that's the branch that's connected to Christ and produces fruit for God's glory. Now, I've, told, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Perhaps one of my greatest fears 
uh, as a pastor is that week after week after week there are people who are uh, faithfully sitting on church pews all across America and even in our church. And they appear to be one thing, but yet they're a totally different thing. You see, I believe there are a lot of Judas branches that are pretending to be Jesus branches. But the Bible makes it very clear that there's something in our life that will eventually, eventually give us away. It will either prove that we are true believers and true followers of Christ, like we say, or it will prove that we are a fake or a counterfeit. And the evidence the Bible calls is fruit. Jesus made a statement on one occasion. He said, you'll know my people by their fruit. God saves us by faith, sure, certainly. But he reveals us by fruit. You're saved by faith, but you'll be known by your fruit. And so this morning, from Jesus' words, I want us to look at three proofs, three things that I think will reveal whether we are a Jesus branch or reveal whether we are a Judas branch. A Jesus branch, one that is connected to Christ, that divinely and supernaturally produces fruit. Or a Judas branch, one that is superficially connected to Christ. But does it produce fruit? Does it? And so first of all, we'll jump right into it. Jesus says, uh, number one, proof that you are in Christ, that you are connected to the true vine. Number one, you'll be productive. You'll be productive. And so the basic theme of this paragraph that, uh, that Jesus is telling, teaching his disciples and preaching here is pro productivity. For in a Christian's life should be thriving with uh, productivity. It ought to be thriving with fruitfulness. Because the point of every vineyard is what? It's to produce fruit. The point of being in the vineyard of God is what? To, to bring glory to God. And fruit is that which brings glory to God. A fruitless Christian ought to be an oxymoron. It ought not exist. Uh, friend, if you've ever been saved by Christ, then Christ has made you a new creation, a new creature. And he's given you the incredible supernatural ability to produce tremendous godly fruit in your life that will bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ. And if you're real, if you are a real branch connected to the real vine of Jesus, then you will produce spiritual fruit. You will. You will. And so the first proof that you are connected to the true vine, Jesus Christ, is productivity. You're fruitful. And so I ask you this morning, maybe you ponder this question for a minute or, or discuss it with your family after you finish watching this sermon. Uh, are you a fruitful follower of Jesus Christ? Not just a follower, but a fruitful follower. Now, the question that may be coming to your mind right now, and I'll try to answer it, is exactly what is this gift of fruit that we ought to be producing? What is it? And that's a good question. That's a valid question. And so let's answer it. Let me tell you what fruitfulness is according to Scripture. Uh, number one, it is character. That is what you are. What you are. You don't have to turn there, but in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the Bible says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And so it, it, it'll start internally, but it'll work itself externally. It's not going to start externally. It'll start on the inside. It'll start with the heart, and eventually it will move uh, to your hands. And these things ought to, ought to grow. Uh, you ought to be becoming more loving. Uh, you ought to become more peaceful. You ought to become more patient. You ought to become more kind. And that means the life, the, the, the character, the personality of Jesus ought to be growing within me, ought to be growing within you. You see, as his life, as the vine uh, pumps through us, if we're truly connected to him, then you ought to become more and more and more like him. God isn't so much interested, I don't think, in what you and I can do for him. I think he's more interested in what he can do through you. And through me. And so fruitfulness is character. That's who we are. Fruitfulness is conduct. That's what we do. It's what we do. Notice you don't have to turn there, but listen to Romans chapter 6, verse 22. It says, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end uh, everlasting life. I think it's a given that godly character will lead to godly conduct. One of the ways I think we can really know whether we're saved, whether we're truly a Christian or not, is, is that we hate sin. You know, God violently hates sin, doesn't he? The Bible's used the word abhor. It says he abhors sin. He hates it. Why? It cost him the life of his precious son. 
It marred his, his universe that he created. It ruins relationships. It ruins people. It ruins uh, uh, marriages. It ruins so many things. God hates it. And you and I ought to hate it. And when God moves into our heart, we ought to hate it like he hates it. And, and what happens is the more we walk with God, I think the more we'll find ourselves hating sin and the more we'll find ourselves longing for righteousness. And I don't think there's a better feeling on this earth than being clean and right with God. Knowing that, 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 that your walk with him is a life that's pleasing in his sight. And boy, the longer I'm connected to the vine of Jesus, the more of the life of Jesus begins to flow through me. And I think the natural result of that will be fruit of holiness and obedience in my conduct. My conduct, how I act, what I do. Fruitfulness is not only character and conduct, but it's contributions. That is what you give. You know, when you begin to grow as a Christian, you will realize that God has brought you into this partnership, if you will, of winning the world to himself. And so he gives us financial resources to, to willingly and generously give, to, to aid in that partnership. Listen to what the Apostle Paul had to say in Romans 15, verse 26. He said, For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Acacia to make certain contributions for the poor saints at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. One of the things that God hates is self-centeredness. That, that's our flesh. That's a natural, that's a natural sin, if you will, that, that we get just by being born. Self-centeredness, selfishness. And so as we grow in him and as we uh, are connected to the true, true vine and we become more like him, one of the fruits that we'll bear is generosity generosity and when God has a hold of our life as you've heard brother Mark and others say through the years he'll also have a hold of your your checking account your bank accounts we'll have a strong desire to to sow seed into God's ministry of winning the world to himself and and uh, friend understand that you don't give to this church to pay the bills although that's what a, a lot of your giving does friend you give simply because you love Christ and you love his church and you want God's work to be done and you want his gospel to go forward that ought to be our motive for giving. So fruitfulness is contributions. Fruitfulness is converts. That is who we win. You know, the more I'm connected to Christ and grow in Christ and love Christ, the more I, I want others to have what I have. The more I want them to experience what I've experienced. And, and I don't think that you'll be able to help that. I think that's a natural fruit that you bear. And it's proof that you belong to God. Jesus said in John chapter number 4, verse 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look unto the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that re re reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying uh, true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap, uh, that whereon you bestowed no labor, other men labored, and you are entered into the labors. Friend, leading Christ is, is not just for uh, Sunday school teachers. It's not just for preachers or missionaries or evangelists. God will give all of us an opportunity to share the good news of what he's done in our lives. There will certainly be people that will probably produce more fruit in this area because I think God gives people uh, in this area to do so. But all of us will have an opportunity uh, to bear the fruit of leading others to Jesus Christ. Now, ultimately, producing Producing fruit is being like Christ. Fruitfulness is godliness. Now you may ask the question, Brother Wesley, isn't it possible though for some of these things to be done by those that aren't really Christians? Sure, sure it is. The, the answer is yes. Some of these things could be counterfeited by the flesh, no doubt. I have no doubt about that. But eventually, eventually over time, I think it'll be detected as fraud, as fake fruit, because real spiritual fruit has in its seeds for more fruit. You see, man-made results will be dead. They won't produce themselves. But spirit-produced fruit will go on producing one life after another. These are fruitful actions born out of godly attitude. And so, and so when fruit multiplies, as it should, in other words, there will be fruit, there will be more fruit, there will be much fruit, and it's not a one-time thing, it's a lifetime thing. As a matter of fact, if you notice in our text, Jesus gives us 
three or four levels of fruitfulness. He says in verses uh, two uh, through five, I think it is, that there will be no fruit, then bears fruit, then bears more fruit, then bears much fruit. Four levels there. And so every single one of us will, will certainly fall into one of those four categories. And Jesus is teaching us that, that God, as the perfect vine dresser, has a desire and a plan to move us from one level up to the next. And we may not understand what he's doing, and we may not understand why he's doing the things that he's doing. But trust that because he loves you and wants the best for you, that God is putting us in optimum position to grow the best and most fruit possible that we can. Now, the question that comes to my mind is, why do we think bearing as much fruit as possible as a Christian is so important to God? Well, thankfully, the text answers the question for us. In verse number 8, it says, Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you should be my disciples. Friend, understand that the fruit of your life, the fruit of my life, is how God is going to receive his honor and his glory upon this earth. And so quantity and quality matters to God. He wants us to go from bearing fruit, from bearing no fruit to bearing fruit to bearing more fruit, to bearing much fruit. And through this, God will be glorified in your life and in mine. Some of you may be saying this right now as you're watching this. Our older crowd may be saying this, Pastor, I just can't do much for God. Pastor, I can't do what I used to do. I don't feel like I'm producing fruit the way I used to produce fruit. And so how in the world does this apply to me? That's a valid question. That's a good question. But let me share with you something that I found as I was researching vineyards and vine branches. Did you know that the best grape vines and the best branches that produce the best fruit are the older ones? They're the older ones. That they don't necessarily produce as much fruit as the younger branches, but they produce the finest fruit. The older vines and the older branches, from what I read, have a way of, uh, of sucking the nutrients out of the ground better than the younger plants. And so their fruit has more depth, it has more complexity, and in reality, when you eat that older fruit, it has more flavor. And what that tells me is that perhaps our most fruitful years will be our final years. Listen, friend, older is not obsolete. I know we live in a culture, a millennial culture, that wants to focus on youthfulness and being young, and we begin to think that getting old could be a bad thing. But the truth is, from God's perspective, our older years perhaps should be our best years, should be our best years. We ought to be producing uh, the best quality of fruit in our life the older we get. You know, the vine dresser, from what I understand, the, uh, the vine dresser spends more time cultivating and focusing special attention on his oldest vines because he knows that his oldest vines are going to give him the most flavorful and the best fruit. Listen, maybe you're an older person listening to me right now. God will take special care of you, but God wants you to continue to produce fruit for his glory. You can produce the finest fruit in the kingdom. Psalms 92, 12 says, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. To show that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Listen, friend, we're not done until we're dead, okay? We're not done until we're dead. And I'm telling you that God can be honored in your age, and you can be very, very valuable to God no matter what your age is. So I've got to move on. And so Jesus gives us this first proof, or this first proof, if you will, that, 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 that we can know that we're connected to him, and that he is, that he is, we're productive. We're productive. Here's the second one. Found in verse number two. Here's the second proof that we can know we're connected to him, whether we're a Jesus branch or a Judas branch, and that is we're pruned. Notice verse two. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. You know how God moves us from producing fruit to producing more fruit to producing much fruit? Well, he uses this Mechanism the Bible calls purging, we'll call it pruning. Now, if you're not familiar with the process of, of pruning, like I wasn't until I started this, then let me explain it to you. It's when the gardener or the farmer cuts back and he cuts off part of the tree or the vine that he's growing that he's caring for. Now, he doesn't do all that cutting to kill the vine and he doesn't want to hurt the vine. He does that to help the vine. 
He doesn't do it to make the vine less fruitful. He does it so that the vine will become more fruitful. Uh, you see, if, if a vine is left unpruned and allowed to grow the way it wants to grow, then it will grow less and it will grow less fruitful. Eventually, it will grow a lot of green leaves, but you won't see very much fruit. And the same thing is true in your life as a Christian. Notice verse 2. It says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, I want you to notice that word, every. Every tells me that you are not going to escape God's attention. I'm not going to escape God's attention. God is a masterful, uh, masterful gardener, farmer. And every branch that does not bear fruit will eventually be cut off, but every branch that belongs to him will eventually be pruned, be pruned. And what I found out about pruning is that pruning is not optional. It's not optional. Every individual branch in that vineyard that produces fruit every single year will be pruned back. It will be cut back, if you will. And because if it's not, like I said, it'll produce some beautiful green leaves, but not much fruit. As a matter of fact, I'm told that each branch is cut back almost all the way to the vine, so much so that if you were to look at it at that moment, you would think that that plant was dead. I mean, they shear it way, way down. And what you have to know and what you have to trust is that God doesn't make mistakes in this pruning process. God's never pruned a Christian, if you will, and looked at their life and said, oops, I shouldn't have done that. God is never caught off guard. He's never caught by surprise. I love that saying I heard Adrian Rogers say that has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? God knows everything, including you, perfectly, perfectly. And so he always prunes Perfectly. Now, what you may have to remember is that God is God, and you and I aren't. And that the gardener is not going to take a pole, and he's not going to find out what the branches want him to do with them. He doesn't go around and say, now, would you like to be pruned here? Would you like the sun to hit you a little more here? Uh, would you want to grow in this direction or in this position? He doesn't do that. Why? Because he knows the point of the vineyard. He knows the, 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 the vine, he knows the fruit. And, and what's the point there? To produce fruit. What's the point of you as a Christian? What's my point in life is to produce fruit. And God's not going to come to me and ask me, uh, Wesley, what do you think is best? Because that's not my job, that's his job. His job is to put me and to put you in the best possible position to grow. And your job is to grow. Your job is to grow. Not just live, but grow. And I think that's why... One reason why people get so mad at God, they think that God owes us an explanation for the things that he does. And bad things happen to us that we consider bad. And God needs to tell us why he did what he did. And God needs to begin to ask us permission uh, to do what he wants to do because our life is our life. Yeah. It's like the little boy who asked if there was anything God couldn't do and he thought about it for a minute and he answered his own question and he said, yeah, there sure is. And the teacher said, what is it? And the boy said, well, he can't please everybody. Listen, God is far less concerned about my comfort than he is my character. He's far less concerned about my comfort than he is my fruit production. And I think there are three things that we need to keep in mind when it comes to this, this idea of pruning. Number one, I realize that it's not punishment. God's not mad at you. God's not mad at me. He's like a surgeon. A good surgeon doesn't go into surgery saying, let's see how much of this person we can cut off and still keep him alive. No, surgeons don't do that because they've got your best interest in mind. And so it is with God when God is pruning back your life. He's cutting away the unnecessary things to keep you to be as productive as you can possibly be. It's not punishment. Understand that sometimes pruning is not pleasant. It may not be pleasant. God has all kinds of ways to prune, and many of them just aren't fun. They're not fun for us to go through. It might be a fiery trial. It might be sickness. It may be hardship. It may be the loss of... Uh, financial possessions, material possessions. It could be slander from someone else. It, it could be that there are people in our lives that, that just aren't good for us. For instance, you, you that have raised kids, then you remember perhaps when your kid used to run around with, uh, with little what's-his-name or little what's-her-name. And little what's-his-name had a negative impact on your precious little boy. 
When your child hung out with him and ran around with little what's his name, then your child would come home and every time he developed some bad habits, he had a bad attitude, he used bad language, and when they were with little what's his name, your child always got into trouble. And so over time, with the best intentions in mind, you began to limit your child's time and your child's involvement with that kid, with little what's his name, for the overall benefit of your child. Your child probably didn't understand it and didn't like it at the time, but it's what was best. And friend, let's be honest, God is smarter than you, and God is smarter than me. And God looks into my life, and he looks into your life, and, and God sees all sorts of little what's-his-names that are negative influences. And he, and he sees someone that may be causing us to be counterproductive or, or promoting unhealthy attitudes and lifestyles and hindering our growth and our effectiveness for the kingdom of God. And sometimes God will step right in and move little what's-his-name out of our life. He might prune that person. Sometimes it's friendships, relationships, maybe a neighbor, maybe a business partner. Boy, there's a whole world, a whole list of these kinds of people that I could, I could go through that may not be good for you. And, and listen, I, I'm not suggesting, and maybe I needed to word this at the beginning. I'm not suggesting that God is going to kill people to get people out of your life. I'm not suggesting that. I'm not saying that God will eliminate people for your benefit. I don't think I'm that important. I don't think you're that important, no offense. But I am convinced that there have been people in my life that I loved, that I cared for, that I have been attached to, that God simply had to remove from my life because they were hindering me from living the most fruitful life that I could possibly live. Pruning can include, can include people. It's not punishment, it's not, it's not fun, but you know what it is, it's priceless. Priceless. Almost sounds like a MasterCard commercial. It's not punishment. It's not pleasant. It's priceless. You know when an apple farmer goes out into his garden, looks at his trees, you know what he wants to see that will bring him the most joy and the most delight for the work that he's put in in his orchard? He wants to see apples, doesn't he? When a vineyard farmer goes out to his vineyard, what does he want to see? He wants to see grapes. He wants to see grapes. You see, Jesus says we are the branches in the vine of Jesus Christ. And when God comes back for you and I, what is it that he wants to see on the branches of his dear son, uh, the people that we call the church? He wants to see a plethora of fruit. fruit. And that's what brings glory, according to verse number 8. Fruit is what brings glory to our Lord and Savior. Here's the third thing, and I'm done. The third proof that, that uh, we are either a Jesus branch or a Judas branch. That the third proof that we can... Be sure that we are found in Christ. Number one, we're productive. Number two, uh, we'll be pruned. But number three, understand we're permanent. We're permanent. Notice verse six. It says, if a man abide not in me, is cast, cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit so ye shall be my disciples, Jesus wanted to make sure we got this. He wanted to make sure we got this. That word abide, if I counted right, appears 11 times in the first 11 verses of the 15th chapter. It appears three times alone in the fourth verse. Jesus is saying, do not miss this. Don't miss this. Trust me. You know a dictionary definition of abide is to stay at the same place where you are. To remain. To remain. Let me give you a more personal definition. Jesus said, I want you to abide in me. Here's what he was saying. I want you to stay 100% permanently attached to me. Attached to me. It's not supposed to be a complicated process of figuring out what this means. Some people make this word abide very complicated. Jesus said, I'm the true vine. You're the branch. Abide. Stay attached to me. Remain in me. And don't miss what he's saying here. He's not saying you need to keep your salvation. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying make sure you stay saved. Don't lose your salvation because that would contradict what he just previously taught when he said no man can snatch you out of my hand. He also said all that the Father gives to me I won't lose. Friend, Jesus isn't talking about losing your salvation here. Judas wasn't a person who lost his salvation. Judas was a false branch who was exposed as a superficial branch that bore no fruit. And so what exactly is Jesus talking about when Jesus says over and over and over, remain in me, abide in me, stay attached to me. Listen, when you come to Christ by faith, 
You are born as a branch, grafted as a branch into the vine of Christ permanently. Permanently. That is salvation. That is your, your union with Christ, if you will. But when Jesus says over and over, abide in me, remain in me, stay attached to me, he's not talking about union with him, but he's talking about communion with him. You see, salvation starts with a union, but it continues with communion. One day it will, it will be completed with a reunion. And every Christian is a part of the union with Christ. If you've ever been saved, you're a part of that union, and you can't lose that. And every Christian will uh, take, play, take part and anticipate a reunion with Christ. But not every Christian, and perhaps the average Christian, neglects really getting into this communion with Christ. Jesus is saying to us as branches, abide in me, commune with me continually so that my life, my voice, my energy, my power, my thoughts, my character, my conduct can flow through you and you'll produce the greatest fruit possible for you to produce. You see, proof that you're in Christ is that you're permanent. And what I mean by that is that you want true communion and you want that connection with God each and every day, that, that, that you want to dig into God's Word and understand how He works and, and His ways, that, that you want to be in His house every chance that you can with other believers and sing praises to Him and learn more from God's Word, that, that you want to be in your prayer closet when, 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 when a, a brother or sister in Christ is hurting so you can intercede for them, that you desperately want to find ways to reach lost world with the gospel. Uh, you want that, commu that, 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 that continuous Continual communion with Christ so that you're clean, so that you're a healthy branch that allows life to flow through your life to another. Again, God's not interested in what I can do for him as much as he's interested in what he can do in and through me. What is the practical outgrowth of this? There are some pictures of how this happens in our everyday life. You'll see in verse 7, Jesus said, my words will abide in you. Verse 10, he says, you'll abide in my love. Verse 11, he says, my joy will abide in you. Now I'm finished, but let me give you some homework, if you will. Tomorrow morning, many of you will get up and go to work. Get up a little bit earlier than normal. Go into your bathroom or wherever and close the door so that nobody can see you and, and hear you. And look at yourself straight in the mirror. In your heart, say this, say, I am a branch. I'm not going to try to be the gardener today, judging others or judging myself. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to try to be the vine today, looking to myself for energy and re relying upon myself for the direction that I need. I'm a branch. I'm a branch. I'm going to stay attached to the vine who is Jesus Christ. And I'm going to depend upon Jesus Christ to live in and through me so that I'll produce the fruit that I need to produce. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning, Take a moment there with your family and have some sort of an invitation. Maybe you pray together. Maybe you talk over this. Maybe you parents discuss this with your children, what it means to be a branch that's attached to the true vine of Jesus Christ. If you have any questions about this, then talk to someone. Call your Sunday school teacher. Call one of our deacons. Call someone you trust. Call me. And let us take these simple thoughts and take God's word show you as best as we know how the gospel of Jesus Christ, how you can be a branch attached to the true vine of Jesus Christ. For those of you that are saved, friend, I told you that union is something you can't lose and that reunion is something you'll certainly be a part of. But what about that communion? What about that communion? Are you producing the fruit that you need to produce? Mark Smith, you come at this time and lead us in a hymn of invitation. He'll sing a verse or two and, and we'll close. Brother Mark.
pray that you've obeyed the Lord this morning, that your heart and mind is clear. We look so look forward to seeing each of you, all that are able and comfortable on Wednesday night. And uh, once again, don't feel pressured or obligated to come, but we do look forward to seeing you. We love you. If we can help you in any way, please reach out to us.